Hey, good evening. Happy to have you with us for another Artist Talk featuring Melissa Cook Benson from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She is part of our visual arts season and we're delighted to have her with us. Her current exhibition called Pieces of Me is displayed in the Alice R. Rogers and Target Galleries at the St. John's Art Center. It will be there through December 12th. I'm Jill W. Kuhn, Gallery Manager for Fine Arts Programming at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Uh, we have been waiting for this wonderful woman to come our way. The art department had highly recommended her and um, she has not disappointed, not in her art nor in her uh, character. She's already been connecting with some of our seniors who are preparing for their own art exhibits um, this spring. So through some Zoom calls, Melissa has been there for them. Melissa's work um, comes from her being drawn to um, a photorealistic type of style, uh, you, working in large scale graphite drawings. Often they're portraits that depict uh, slices of life, uh, her children, uh, parenthood, uh, COVID times. And she's received her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has numerous uh, pieces uh, that have been uh, displayed na nationally and locally. We may have had an opportunity to see her work at the Minnesota Museum of American Art, or actually she acts also has pieces in the Minnesota Vikings U.S. Bank Stadium art collection. Melissa creates thin layers of graphite dusted on the paper with a dry brush. She doesn't use a pencil, no pencil marks. Instead, the results glow, uh, not only on the surface, but in her lovely compositions. Soon, Melissa is going to join us and tell us more about her process and about life as an artist. Before I do that, uh, I do need to mention to our students attending uh, that for their live stream portion for their fine art experience or FAE, they need to do the following. During the presentation, a code will appear on the screen for five minutes. At that time, please click the link in the video description below and fill out the form that comes up. You will have, as I said, five minutes of the code being displayed to receive your credit. If you do indeed have any issues, please email fae at csbsju.edu. Okay, now I would love to turn this over to our featured artist, Melissa Cook Benson, who is joining us in her studio. Hey, Melissa. Hi, Jill. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's, hey, it... <laughs> it's such an honor to be here. And uh, thank you all for joining us digitally. I wish we could do this in person in the gallery, but you know, special times call for special measures. So first off, I'd like to thank Jill for all of her help and support and her knowledge. Uh, along with all the staff at St. John's and St. Benedict's, they've all been very uh, supportive and thoughtful. And I would also like to thank um, my friends and faculty at uh, the art department. Thank you for recommending me. The gallery is beautiful and it's an honor to show there. Um, I'd like to thank my husband, Eric Benson, who if you tuned in at the very beginning, you saw him. He is part of Pack Horse Fine Arts, which is uh, one of the best art handling companies. And he helped me install my show. So thank you to him and for watching our wild children while I attempt to make artwork in my studio every day. 
Um, I'd also like to thank my family because they were a lot of inspiration for many of the drawings that you will be seeing. So I'd like to thank the strong women in my family, my grandma, my mother, and my daughters. Um, I'd also like to thank the Minnesota State's Art Board for granting me an arts initiative grant, along with the voters of Minnesota for supporting the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. So thank you very much. Now I look forward to uh, walking you digitally through this gallery show. Yes. So uh, to start off, I thought I'd give you a little insight into my process. So this is a picture of my palette, which is actually a stool that I uh, put some powder graphite on and then I dust it on with that brush. So here I have my graphite. I turned the label so it's not like a commercial. <laughs> You'll have to guess the company. Um, <laughs> And then here's that, that brush. So this brush has been my brush since I started this process in 2008. Um, and it's on its last limb. I don't even know what it is anymore because the title or like the brand and everything has worn off. Um, so you can see how worn out it is. Anyways, so the way that this process works is that I dust on this powdered graphite and I slowly add layer after layer of thin graphite and slowly build up the value and then I erase away details and then add another layer of graphite and then erase away more details and on and on and on. And this process started back in 2008 and at the time I was in grad school. Um, so if you want to go to the next image. So I was in grad school at the time. So this is my studio back in 2008. And the first series I did was powdered graphite. So you can see from the, the floor how uh, dirty this process used to be. And uh, over the past 12 years, I've refined it so that now it's not quite as dusty. Um, and so what powdered graphite is, is it's uh, got a bit of like a tooth to it. Um, it's actually used as a lubricant in guns and machines, so it's got a slight stickiness to it. So um, as you can see in that studio or right here behind me, I uh, tape my drawings or tape the paper to the wall and I dust this graphite on and um, work large scale. So back in 2008 when I first found this uh, material, there was maybe three people over there the previous three months who had told me, hey, maybe you should check this out. It might be something you would connect with. And after three people tell me something, I feel like it means something, it might be fate. <laughs> so uh, I grabbed graphite, it hung out in my studio for a while and I actually picked it up one day out of frustration because I was struggling with things in my studio. And um, as soon as I started dusting, I fell in love. And um, I've been working with it ever since. So I've just been refining the process and um, my technique ever since 2008. Wow. And, and that brush is like the main brush or the only brush that you use? That's, well, that's the main brush, uh, but okay. it was the, the very first brush right. I used and it's holding on literally by the last hairs. <laughs> I've had to like super glue it back together a couple times. Uh, my other brush that was maybe one year younger than this brush, that one just split in half. So I'm just having to branch out into new brushes after <laughs> 12 years, which you know is a good investment. Yeah. It only takes two brushes. That's not bad. <laughs> So maybe the, the next image is uh, the process behind the drawing that I'm still working on behind me. So if you press play, this is a stop motion animation of the first hour of the process. You can see that I'm uh, laying out uh, a few details and some basic values. So uh, the areas that I know that are going to be really dark, like some of the shading in my hair, um, 
I put it down pretty dark at the beginning and then I erase away details. So I essentially erase away hair, hair by hair. And then I put more graphite on. So it becomes this um, additive and subtractive process. So that was the first hour. And then I have um, of work, so laying down that basic framework for a drawing. And then the next slide is another stop motion animation of an entire drawing. So that'll give you a little insight into the entire process. So you can see those basic values getting laid out. And then I erase away those details. So you can see that uh, the bubbles and the ripples, they're starting to um, get erased away. And then sometimes they fade away again and they come back. That's that additive subtractive process that you got to see a little bit very quickly. And that was my <laughs> studio in Brooklyn back in wow. 2000 and 2012, I think. All right, so now is a little virtual tour of the show. So um, this first piece is called Valentine and, or Doily, and it is about 37 inches by 37 inches. And this image is based on um, a Valentine that my four-year-old daughter had drawn. So I'm interested in um, sometimes playing with the history of trompe l'oeil. And for people who might not be familiar with that term, it means to uh, trick the eye. So with trompe l'oeil, many artists have, will take things that they find. So whether it be um, paper ephemera or notes or sometimes um, little trinkets and they'll attach it to a wall and then they'll use that as a still life to draw from. So what I liked about this image is that it had uh, kind of the delicate doily that was like a really nice challenge for me. But then on top of that, there's these really spontaneous um, childlike marks that are basically unself-conscious. And I love that hand of young children drawing because they draw with such gusto. And so I thought that would be an interesting challenge to try to balance those two things. And so that's that piece. The next piece is uh, called The Family Jewels. And this one is uh, 50 inches by 37 inches. And this is my take on a Renaissance portrait. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is a drawing. One of my favorites. I love this piece so much. <laughs> so this one is uh, kind of my take on a Renaissance portrait. And it's got the uh, crown, but upside down. And in the corner, I don't know if you can tell, it's got a little gnarly Elsa braid. So this was my daughter's favorite thing. She, I think she was about three and a half here. And so um, it was, you know, we're not quite royalty. So I wanted to uh, kind of play with that, that motif. And then she's got the, uh, the lacy collar, collar, which is, and that the hand. So I was playing with some of that uh, very traditional portraiture of the Renaissance. And then next, uh, this one's called Grandma's Necklace. And uh, this is about, uh, about 37 by 50, a little bit smaller. And uh, this was trying to think of the viewpoint of a child. So looking up <sighs> to an adult or, you know, uh, someone, someone who you look up to, both physically and metaphorically. Um, and then thinking about how those people model um, behavior, but also um, roles of femininity, femininity, I'm sorry. And then uh, I also started thinking too with COVID, the idea of the mother's bo bosom being like a place of comfort. So, and I liked the idea of drawing that lace again. So this next piece is uh, called 
Raising Butterflies, AKA Rainbow. And this is 37 by 50 inches. And this one was completed barely before the show started. I was er, b barely before the show opened. So I was feverishly <laughs> trying to finish this one. And uh, this one was like a little ray of sunshine uh, during all the summer quarantine that uh, our family was in and everybody was in really. And uh, my family found uh, a little caterpillar, a monarch caterpillar crawling on our milkweed. And so we took it inside and raised it from a chrysalis until uh, it hatched. And it actually hatched, uh, got out of the jar, flew for the first time, and then immediately landed on me and his wings dried out on me for the next two hours. And so it was a really magical moment. Um, and I thought like the idea too of it, a butterfly being essentially kind of in captivity, but leaving captivity, um, I thought in some ways was a metaphor for what we were going through, or still going through. Yes. Was that the first time that you uh, had had raised uh, a butterfly from from the chrysalis? Yes. Uh, so uh, it actually started because we saw um, another, a previous caterpillar on one of our milkweeds go into the J shape and become a chrysalis on that leaf. And we got okay. so excited about it. And then we were following it every day, like my four-year-old would run outside and check on this this butter or this um, chrysalis. And then one day it started deflating, and so it was really sad. Like it died, and we saw this little, like uh, I think a spider come out of it. So we're like, oh. that that butterfly did not make it. So when we saw this next caterpillar, I was like, I gotta take it into my hands. So I like immediately started. Google searching, and I found out that like a huge majority of these um, chrysalises die in the process. Like they never become butterflies. Yeah, I was surprised by that too. Yeah, so I had to take, at that point I was like, we need to take this into our own hands. And then it became this really lovely educational thing for my kiddo too. And then uh, when it was, when its wings were drying out in the mason jar, uh, she drew the butterfly along with me. So it was this really great kind of bonding moment too. It was magical. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful piece as well. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so the next one is called Pieces of Me. And this one is uh, 50 inches by 37 inches. And this piece is uh, based on after I had uh, a haircut, a self-imposed haircut, because um, unbeknownst to me before I got pregnant, um, I didn't know that for some women, uh, you don't lose hair for essentially the entire time you're pregnant. And then after you give birth, six months later, you lose massive quantities of hair at once. And so like I would take a shower and just like have like a hairball come out. And so at a certain point I was like, I'm done with this. I got to cut it off. So I cut off 15 inches of hair and then photographed it uh, in, in our yard in the grass. And so, um, yeah, it's like those small, sac small and big sacrifices you have to make as a parent. Well, and with your show being called Pieces of Me, uh, that, you know, you're, you're including just slices of life of ordinary experiences uh, that, that we go through as, as a mom, as, uh, as a parent, uh, trying to understand the COVID stay at home, um, uh, all of this. So uh, do you, do you want to speak more t uh, about the naming of the exhibition? Yeah, uh, so, this piece? So I use this as kind of an overarching name for the show because um, 
I feel like there's so many knowing and unknowing sacrifices that you make as a caregiver. So, you know, like I said, I didn't realize that I would be losing massive quantities of hair. Um, but so it's like this metaphorical continual giving of yourself, not only your, your body, your hair, but also like your mind, your focus, your energy. It's like these little pieces that you're willing to share with your loved ones. Um, and that sacrifice, I think, of sharing yourself, I think, is both beautiful, but also complicated, you know? And this, the background of it is resting on, on grass as you, mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the contrast of the values is amazing, but also just how your compositions are, are very, um, it, I don't know, they're, they're very intimate. I feel mm -hmm. they really, I, perhaps the scale of it also uh, does that, but um, I, I love the repetitiveness of the grass with also the counter uh, curves of your, you see me talking with my hands, of, <laughs> of the hair itself. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes too, I like to throw in like a really good challenge. Like mm -hmm. I, I've always been drawn to drawing hair, like for example, this one or that one. Um, but when you throw grass in it, it makes it even more complicated, which I, I love too. Yeah. So this one was actually done in 2018, so a couple years ago, but uh, was essentially the preface to the previous one where uh, this was after my first kid and uh, was inspired by an iPhone uh, photo that I had been using the iPhone as essentially a mirror. And I was like, what is going on up here? And I realized <laughs> that I had these little tiny baby bangs because it was all my hair growing back after it all had fallen out. Um, and so uh, I, also, I also didn't think of it initially as a drawing. It was only after quite a few months I was looking through my photos and when I saw this one, I was like, it kind of highlights both, I think that quietness and the solitude, the reflection of early parenthood. And you can see in the corner, there is both a laundry basket and kind of the sh shadowing of a crib. So um, yeah, it's kind of the longest, shortest time, isn't it, being a parent? especially at the very beginning when it's just you and your partner and a, a little tiny baby. With, with no manual. Yeah. <laughs> no how-to guides. Although no. the internet, the internet no. has so many opinions, right? <laughs> yes. Which one do you listen to? <laughs> yes. I know, but that's remarkable. So this piece uh, was actually started back in 2017. And then um, I had to roll it up and um, kind of put it on hold because I uh, had to work on some commission work. Um, but this is inspired uh, by my grandmother and my firstborn's first meeting. So she lives in Wisconsin and I live in Minnesota. And so this piece is um, that it first embrace. And um, it's uh, size wise 40 by 60 inches. Uh, the name is First Embrace Great Grandma. And um, after, after COVID started, um, I re brought this piece out because I felt like all of a sudden it had a new meaning because. Um, being separated from family or friends, our community, and especially our elders. I felt like this piece uh, was essentially trying to look back or um, give a, a nod to missing those embraces, missing that touch, missing that love and connection. And so I felt like I wanted to see these hands together. So, um, yeah, that piece was finished just a couple months ago. Uh, uh, 
It's it's another one that in the gallery, um, I mean, all again, the layout and everything worked out so just evolved around, but uh, the the lines, the format of it and everything. But yes, that, that human touch, it is mm -hmm. a perfect selection for this time. Thank you. So this piece is called Makeover, 22nd Day of Quarantine. So this was back when I thought this uh, social distancing was only going to last you know, a short time. And uh, back then I was letting my children have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, luxuries, or not luxuries, but, you know, I gave them a little bit more slack. So uh, I let my kiddos draw on my face with washable markers. She was like, hey, mommy, you're a kitty now. So I have whiskers on my cheeks and she did my hair too, but I cut that part out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, and then in terms of the angle, I was thinking about essentially the viewer being in the position of my kid drawing on my face. Um, and similar to that first image that we saw of that Valentine, I liked the mm -hmm. idea of, um, the photorealism or, or the realism, uh, kind of, uh, balanced with that gestural, you know, childlike mark making. So it was, I, I like that. Um, I like being able to play with that different kind of hand in a way. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful contrast. Uh, the framing of, of how much of your hair that you decided to in, include. Um, and the vantage point, I, I appreciate you sharing that as well of of thinking about your composition and from what perspective um mm -hmm. the viewer is seeing it yeah because i was sitting on the floor i think on a pillow and she was just going crazy with her crayolas all over my face so i like the idea of you were being in that position um knowingly or unknowingly it's um, actually pretty relaxing to to have done to you <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I like makeover time when she combs my hair. And <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so this last piece is called Inside or Window. And uh, this piece was, uh, you know, from the inside of the window looking out which I felt like was a, uh, a view many of us had. But um, on the window, there's all of these Valentines that my daughter had made. So um, they are, you know, they were up for a while, but I felt like they kind of brightened, brightened our days when we were, you know, in isolation. And then this was also a challenge given to me by my husband, Eric Benson, who is also an artist. I think he wanted uh, to challenge me to do something that was really out of my comfort zone. So instead of drawing hair and flesh, I was drawing angles and drywall and uh, plants. And man, I should have included uh, a detail because um, I actually learned, figured out some new techniques in this process through this challenge. And so, um, I'm able to get super sharp lines now, which is exciting. And so now I'm actually interested in, you know, pressing some boundaries on what I can draw in terms of, uh, you know, angular things instead of just flesh. Yes. Yes. Well, we have we have some questions that are coming in, and I may have a few questions for you as well. Uh, so. One of the first ones that um, we would like to ask you is how many pieces uh, of work do you typically work on simultaneously? Um, so back, back in grad school, I used to work on like one at a time until they were completed. 
And uh, I met my husband at an artist residency and uh, at Bemis, at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art in, in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, yeah, Nebraska. Uh, and uh, it was this beautiful, huge studio space, live-in studio space. And he's like, you gotta have a whole bunch of stuff going. And so ever since then, I have worked on multiple things at, at a time which I find actually gives me a lot of um, freedom because every once in a while I'll hit a spot in a drawing where either my, something gets complicated and it, it almost becomes a chore. Like it, it, you have to work through, I have to work through something in my head or with my hand, I have to figure out a new technique before moving forward. So back when I only did one at a time, I feel like I got, I could get stuck sometimes. And then that one drawing would sit like with no progress being made for sometimes weeks. But now that I have like multiple things going at, at once, as soon as I get sick of drawing hairs, I can go over here and start drawing some flowers or that was uh, a nice part about drawing the window too is like, Sometimes you just have to switch up the vibe of what you're drawing to keep your process active. Yeah. Um, so often, I mean, you have the back and forth. Um, sometimes you just need to marinate a, about something as well. Yes. Uh, do you ever, this also makes me want to ask, do you ever have a difficult time knowing when you're done with a particular piece? Um, every once in a while, but usually what I'm looking for is at the end of, uh, at the end of the piece, when I feel like it's really coming together, it starts to have this shine, like it shines from within. And there's something about that moment that I need to make sure to stop at that moment. Um, because it's almost like it's got its own life then. Um, yeah. um, and so uh, I like to, to sometimes even have multiple pieces at multiple stages so that I can continually work through them. Um, ideally, I'd like to have like five, six things going at once, but sometimes that's not possible. Like, especially after a show, after you put up a show, you, I, I tend to only have a few things going, but even right now I have these two going behind me, one over here and the very start of something over there so that's four pieces in the past what month yeah not quite even a month a couple weeks i know yeah you are you're on fire um i i wanted to ask you you've met, made some references to um your experiences during COVID, and this was a question that i had asked our last artists as well that um a lot of people during the stay at home order really found that uh, art was a coping skill that they could use. And um, how, how does your art affect your psyche? Well, uh, even before COVID, I always have used my artwork to process my life. So um, either relationships, my environment, what's happening in the world, um, things I'm thinking about. And so with COVID, it's, again, you know, the way I've been processing life now, um, new challenges. And for me, drawing has always been a meditation. So it's, it's a place where I can escape. And um, there's like, this freedom in making and having that time alone where like you you get into like a whole nother met, like meditative state in your head um and not only that my i think the scale of the drawings that i make um it's a bigger scale and so when i make them i actually walk backwards and forwards from the wall so that's why i hang them on the wall is i can continually make a mark step back, look at what's happening, and then, you know, uh, go back and do more work. And so it becomes almost like a dance. And so 
I think sometimes that physicality is also like a nice release, a nice way of processing life, um, a nice way to reflect too. I think a lot of uh, with imagery, you can really think about and digest what's going on around you through making images and working through things that way. When you just mentioned the stepping back and the movement, uh, maybe maybe this connects with uh, a statement. Um, you, you've described your work as investigating the relationship between photography, performance, and drawing in por portraiture. And so I definitely understood, you know, the photograph uh, working, you know, documenting, um, using those, <clears throat> excuse me, as as a reference for your compositions and then uh, the the drawing itself. But what about the performance? Is What do you mean by that? So uh, that was, uh, if you go visit the gallery, the back gallery is some of my um, work from my archives. So from like 2015 and before. And some of uh, my work specifically back in like 2009 through 2012 was very performative. So I used to make a lot of self, all of my drawings back then were self portraits. And, but it was me dressing up as different characters and essentially performing as a way of processing things that were happening in my life, like relationships and whatnot. Um, so that performative element has, it's not quite as I think readily, uh, a, like not quite as apparent now, but I think sometimes there's still an element of it. Like with this one, you know, I didn't actually leave the house. Now that one's what gonna be called pandemic hair or pandemic, yeah. something like that. I, I, I'm still working through the title. So, yes. um, I braided my hair over a mask um, because, you know, I haven't had a, a haircut in <laughs> six months. I had bangs at the beginning of the <laughs> um, of COVID. Now I don't. Um, so this one has a, a slightly performative element, but probably not as much as back then. Um, yeah. Uh, it's It's a, yeah. COVID and and so many people can speak about hair during and <laughs> and the evolution of styles during that time. Um, <laughs> you mentioned my maybe my last question that I have for you and uh and then feel free to share anything else that you would like uh is uh you mentioned that you're married to uh, a fellow artist. You mentioned uh your husband's name is Eric. Um I, my question just is, is what's it like being married to another artist? I, I mean, perhaps, you know, well, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, well, at this point, I can't imagine it any other way, right? Um, right. So I think being married to another another artist uh, is, there can be a lot of inspiration, uh, like his work ethic and the way that he sees the world really inspires me. Um, and that work ethic can be a motivator too. So he's got a very um, dedicated daily process that he wants to be in a studio daily to like work through things that he's thinking about. And I think that is uh, not only, like I said, inspiring, but uh, also a motivating challenge uh, for me to do the same. Um, I think it's nice that he understands kind of uh, my priorities and sometimes the way my brain thinks. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think since we're both artists, we both have like this kind of unconventional approach to many things, like everything from DIY, like we, we have a fixer upper house in Minneapolis and we've done everything to it together. Um, the only challenge since we're both artists is that 
you know, sometimes we have competing visions. So specifically the the garden, oh. the garden. We, yeah. we there's been some very heated discussions about which perennial, where, what, what, not. and why. Um, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then sometimes too competing for time because you know we both want to be in our, our studios but we can't really have a, a 20 month old and a four year old in our studio at the same time and really focus um yeah so but i think it's i think it's a, an interesting way to raise kids uh having two artist parents who you know look at the world in very different ways um be good for that man yeah, yeah not too I, not too wild or something <laughs> well i i would think um the under the the understanding and uh the need <clears throat> for both of you to have your studio time um because that taps into a part of you that um can't be can't be met any other way and mm. and it's uh and then balancing that with parenting uh the the day to day uh that i was wondering if it would feel sometimes competitive like you have to you know uh bargain for your time but from talking to you earlier it sounds like you guys have a schedule you know that you try to yeah. adhere to We've got yeah. a COVID schedule. He gets the mornings, I get the afternoons. And sometimes too, if uh, our little one is taking a nap, the four-year-old will sit in our studios and uh, draw or paint too, because she's she's totally got that the artist gene in her. She loves, she loves drawing. She, like I said, she drew that butterfly and it was like, amazing and then she drew a, a cicada she did a scientific illustration of a cicada and wrote cicada she's like four years old it's, like, oh, uh, mercy. it's probably because you know i'm biased whatever <laughs> yeah she's a genius yes <laughs> hey i have one last question that came in for you if you don't mind um okay why yeah. do you why do you work at a monumental scale um so I, I love working big because um, kind of like I mentioned before, not only does the process become almost like a dance with my drawing, this back and forth where, you know, I make a mark and then I step back and then I uh, make another mark. But also I think that scale um, allows me to be really physical in, in my drawing. So um, when my my friends or anyone have, have actually watched me draw they were actually surprised at how i'm not doing anything like this it's very gestural marks that you know like these marks that slowly get um refined and so i think not only the scale lets me be physical like that but then it it allows since i i zoom into the subject um being close up on the subject gives me a little bit more freedom to have my hand and take artistic liberties and um, have more mark making and still have it make sense in, in my mind. Um, and I also kind of like that a viewer can almost walk into the drawing, like be surrounded by it and hopefully impacted that way um, you know, there's something really beautiful about having something intimate and, and small that you can, you know, little gem like things, but there's, I think some wow factor too, when something is big and can really hit someone almost in the chest, like you walk into it and it can hit you in the chest and, and still have that intimate moment with it. Yeah. That, uh... Uh, that was definitely one of the considerations when uh, hanging the exhibition, mm -hmm. you know, was was the height. So that kind of effect, the intimacy could happen. Uh, yeah. wh what is also really remarkable about your work is because of its size, you do see it from a distance and and it has that impact um, in, in that way of what is, you know, what is this? Oh, my goodness. And then it draws you in even more. Yeah. And then because of the size, it's almost like it's surrounding you. 
Yeah, that's always yeah. my goal is to draw draw them in, and then yes. like hopefully they'll stick stick around for the marks and for the details and for you know the ideas behind the piece too. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you, Melissa, very thank very you, much. Jill. This, this was, has been fun. <laughs> yes, I I agree, and um, it's it's always very enlightening to just hear about the process and then your ideas behind the pieces as well. And um, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I wanna thank our, our viewers as well for being with us this evening. And um, the show Pieces of Me by Melissa, as I said, is, op is up until December 12th at the St. John's Art Center. Um, our hours were open from 11 to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. And on Wednesdays, we have the FAE Wednesdays for our students, especially to come between one and five for those FAE requirements. We're closed on Sundays and Mondays. So the gallery has a limit of 10 visitors uh, with masks socially distancing while soaking up the art for 15 minutes at a and time. And we also placed the drawings six feet apart so that, you know, it's kind of forced socially distanced. <laughs> yes, yes. And the size of that gallery is fantastic for your exhibition and also for what we need to do right now in order to experience art, which our souls yeah. hunger for. Yeah. So um, I want to say to the to uh, the rest of you out there to join us for our next live stream event that will be November 5th at 7 o'clock. Um, it will feature Sandra Brick, who is a visual artist, and Fred Amram, who is a, a literary artist. And lest we forget, is really a, a piece about um, an exhibit that's about the coming of age um, of a young Jewish boy first in Holocaust Germany and then as a refugee in the United States. It's a timely exhibit for 2020. It's currently up at the Goretzky Gallery uh, in the Benedicta Art Center located at the College of St. Benedict. Oh, thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you, Jill. And thanks to all the viewers tuning in. I only wish I could see everybody's faces. I know, same here, but I loved looking at yours. Yes, uh, yours as well, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. And to the rest of you, good night, stay well, vote, and live artfully. Good night. Good night. <laughs>